we rose up together, and together we will die for righteousness. To return Japan to Japan's true form, that is why we die. Is it enough to insist on the sanctity of life, even when the soul is dead? What sort of military holds nothing above the value of life? Gentlemen, we are now going to show you a value even greater than the sanctity of life. That is not freedom nor democracy. It is Japan. The country of history and tradition that we love. Japan. Is there no one here who will throw their bodies against this degenerate constitution and die? If there is, stand with us and die with us now. We have undertaken this action in the fervent hope that you, gentlemen, who have the purest of souls, may be reborn as individual men and as warriors. These are the last words of Japanese author and revolutionary Yukio Mishima. On November 25, 1970, Mishima and four other men barricaded themselves in an office of a Japanese military base in central Tokyo. After securing the commandant, Mishima appeared on the balcony and began addressing the soldiers that had gathered outside. His speech was intended to inspire a coup and restore the emperor to power. For his efforts, the soldiers heckled him, and having failed to incite a coup, he committed suicide in the commandant's office. A seemingly ignominious end for one of the 20th century's greatest wordsmiths. Many people were quick to dismiss Mishima as a right-wing lunatic. A relic of a bygone era that could not find a place for himself in the Americanized Japan that followed World War II. Mishima was troubled by how quickly his countrymen had abandoned their roots, and though he was not alone in his concerns, he was in an ever-dwindling minority. But Mishima was no fool. He recognized the power of language and cultural narrative. In 45 years of life, he managed to publish 34 novels, in addition to 25 books of short stories and 50 plays. Whatever you might think of his politics, Mishima represents both to Japan and the greater literary world the end of an era. For not long after his death, the world of fiction and film would see a massive paradigm shift to books, movies, and more that were disentangled from the wider world and focused more on providing the masses with hollow fantasy. Good riddance, they say. We are better off without him. We are better off without anyone like that. And while the disgust they feel when reading about Mishima's more extreme views might be understandable, what we have replaced him with is more insidious and vile than anything we could have imagined. Now, with most of the stars of Japanese film and literature having faded, we find ourselves at the precipice of a cultural dark age from which we may not soon emerge. If you were to ask me what the greatest film ever made was, I would answer without hesitation that it is Akira Kurosawa's Ikiru from 1952. Though having a Kurosawa film as one's favorite might be unsurprising, one might expect one of his bigger hits like Rashomon or Seven Samurai, and while those are both excellent films, they are jidaigeki, or period dramas, set in the Japan of old. In contrast, Ikiru is a film set in modern-day Japan. It is a critique of not only Japanese post-war society, but also of the individual Japanese, and how they can't call what they are now as being alive. The protagonist, a useless bureaucrat nearing retirement, finds out he has stomach cancer and has less than a year to live. Having wasted his life and being estranged from his greedy son and daughter-in-law, he begins a journey of self-discovery, ultimately finding not only the courage with which to face his death, but the will to leave this world in a better state than it was when he entered it. Ikiru is a profoundly important film that has been largely forgotten in the modern age. It is a film that I firmly believe that could not be made today. Not for reasons of pacing or politics, but because we now exist in a sort of 21st century Menefrego, 
that is almost militantly invested in keeping the problems of our time vague and undefined, a generation where entertainment has become less about cultural expression and more about hedonistic escapism. It's easy to see why. The global market size of the anime industry was $24.8 billion in 2021, and that number is expected to exceed $26 billion in 2022. At home and abroad, anime is now synonymous with Japanese culture. Of the highest grossing Japanese movies of all time, the top 10 is made up entirely of anime movies. And what does one find when perusing lists of top anime? Take, for example, the franchise Uma Musume, Pretty Derby, a series that has also a mobile game that has seen more than $1 billion in revenue, whose plot synopsis reads, In a world very much like our own, great racehorses of the past have a chance to be reborn as horse girls. Girls with the ears and tails of horses, as well as their speed and endurance. The best of these horse girls go to train at Tokyo's Tracen Academy, hopefully moving on to fame and fortune as both racers and idols. Or how about Keijo, which reads, A series set in an alternate reality, where a new woman-only gambling sport, known as Keijo, becomes a fad in Japan. Its matches are held atop floating platforms, known as land, in a swimming pool stadium. The players fight to defeat their opponents, and send them into the water using only their breasts or butts. In 2017, this anime became so popular that a group of people from Portugal actually tried making this a real sport. Meanwhile, the list of influential Japanese books and films grows ever shorter. Haruki Murakami, the last of the Japanese fiction giants, is now over 70 years old. His books, which frequently deal with the subject of men being lost both emotionally and existentially, now go largely unread by a generation that could use them more than ever before. Of course, the blame for the slow death of the Japanese literary and filmmaking tradition cannot be laid entirely at the hands of the anime and manga industry. After all, these things are determined by the market. Where there once existed a craving for a creative exploration of the human condition, there now exists a fevered demand for assembly line decadence. And as entertaining as some of them may be, they do much to rob the viewer of a window into both societies and individuals that have endured more change in a century than humanity has in several millennia. Culture is now something that follows the almighty dollar. To many, Japan is anime. The country and its people are nothing more than a cartoon whose lives are being played out in a sequence of events for the purposes of entertainment. Books that make up the core of the Japanese experience go largely unread in schools. And while there is something that we can forgive in a youth that chooses to indulge in comics and cartoons rather than studies, what cannot be forgiven is the rise of the most degenerate group in human history. John Calhoun was an American ethologist famous for his experiments with rats and mice. You may have heard the term behavioral sink before, a theory that describes the collapse in behavior that can result from overcrowding. Calhoun's experiments revolved around creating utopian societies for rodents and observing the effects on a species of having no lack of food, water, or mating opportunities. In 1962, Calhoun observed the following. Many female rats were unable to carry pregnancy to full term or survive delivery of their litters if they did. An even greater number, after successfully giving birth, fell short in their maternal functions. Among the males, the behavior disturbances ranged from sexual deviation to cannibalism and from frenetic overactivity to a pathological withdrawal from which individuals would emerge to eat, drink, and move about only when other members of the community were asleep. Many parallels have been drawn between Calhoun's work with rodents and the inevitable collapse of human societies. 
and nowhere are these connections more pronounced than with the modern anime otaku. It's no secret that the population of Japan has been in decline for nigh on half a century. Every year, fewer babies are born. More and more, we see the rise of especially young men that do not participate in dating or mating. They continue to live either with their parents or alone in small apartments. Some may work, but many may not. Their days are filled with a potent mix of anime, manga, and video games. This phenomenon is not limited to Japan. Americans, Europeans, and other East Asians, every day they consume thousands upon thousands of hours of this so-called Japanese culture, their relationship to which is akin to that of Calhoun's rats to their automated feeders. But my hobbies are my own, they cry. I decide what to do with my free time, and as long as I'm not hurting anybody, who cares? Yet as the years go by, this excuse rings hollow, because these people don't exist in a vacuum. They are part of our homes, our communities, our societies. The term weeaboo, or weeb for short, began to be used in the 21st century to describe non-Japanese who had an obsession with Japan and Japanese culture. But there is a caveat to this. You won't find students of Japanese literature under the moniker of weeb, nor will you see passionate film watchers fall under this umbrella. Weeb is used almost exclusively for young men who consume anime and manga at such an extreme rate that it becomes detrimental to their physical and mental health. Many members of this community are not content to simply buy, watch, and enjoy a show. They also commission art, buy figures, clothing, and other accessories related to the shows that they obsess over. This in itself drives profits, and as the consumer demand for increasingly degenerate content rises, so too does the supply. The circle continues. Sexually frustrated men, both young and old, demand increasingly debaucherous content. They submerge themselves deeper and deeper in like-minded circles on forums and social media. At a certain point, the level of degeneracy one can display becomes a form of social currency. Through a process that takes place over the course of decades, the seemingly benign choices of the individual create ripples throughout society that turn into waves. The modern weeb have become the rats in Calhoun's cage, living without care for rations or fear of predators, locked inside the prison that our vaunted liberty made for them. Is it too late? <sighs> Weebs, we're learning how to read. Yeah,